This morning, there is a portion before us that I would bring to your attention. If you have your Bible uh, or on a phone or a good old printed Bible, I would invite you to turn with me to the book of Philippians chapter 2. The book of Philippians, just to set the stage here to provide some context, the book of Philippians is a book that was actually a letter. Oftentimes we talk about books of the Bible, but there are various genres of literature in the Bible. The book of Revelation is an apocalyptic sort of genre. It means it has these wild stories and images of things that will happen in the future. The book of Ezekiel has the same sort of imagery, the book of Daniel oftentimes. But in the New Testament, once you get past the gospel accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, then you get past the book of Acts, which tells about the acts of God in working through the early believers. Then you come to these books that are called the letters. In fancy church terms, they're called the epistles. But we want to focus today on one of those epistles, and it was written to a group of people who lived in Philippi. That's in Asia Minor in the ancient world. It's just above the land of Israel. In order to go from the land of Israel down here to Europe, you have to go right through Turkey and Greece. And so Turkey and Greece were trade routes. And we're going to see that the ministry of the Apostle Paul focused primarily on those trade routes. Some of the trade routes went overseas. They would go from Israel through Syria into Turkey into Greece and then up into Europe. Other times they would just get on a ship and go across the Mediterranean. And from there they could get to the ports in Turkey, the, the ports in Italy. Uh, there were Jewish communities all along those routes. Uh, very interestingly, my wife's family is from one of those Jewish communities that is from the biblical city of Smyrna. If you read your New Testament, you'll read of the, the city of Smyrna uh, in the book of Revelation. It was one of the ports of call, and it had a very large Jewish population up until around two generations ago. And uh, about three generations ago is when my wife's grandparents left the Jewish community there to come to America. And so these are real places. Um, I just recently completed a, a series of studies uh, trying to finish up my master's. And uh, we had to study world religions. This was part of the, the requirement. And I noted just recently how many world religions are built on air. For instance, they had told us in one of these world religions about all of these gods and goddesses and all of their activities in various layers of heaven. And when you ask for a single shred of physical evidence that these people ever existed or that the places ever existed, there is none. It's simply as we call, as we say in Yiddish, it's a bubamaisa. It's an, it's an old story that really has no veracity to it. In contrast, the historical accounts in the Bible take place in real place in the Middle East and various places that can be identified. We can go to the city of Jerusalem today, the capital of Israel. You can put a spade almost anywhere in the ground and you will find evidence of the kings that are spoken of in the Bible. Just a few years ago, they found increased evidence of the king known as Hezekiah. We find his name in stone inscriptions that have long since been buried. These are oftentimes in cities that have been conquered. There tends to be rubble that goes on top. And so all of these old stone inscriptions uh, become buried and they're kind of safe. And so the archaeologists come along and they uncover these and we see more and more evidence of the very people mentioned in scripture. We see about the miracles. When scientists look at the walls of Jericho, they see that those walls collapsed in a totally unpredictable way. There is evidence of the claims of the Bible. These people are mentioned. Contrast that with the wild stories that 
third world religions will often make up to keep people kind of on the hook. We have not believed, as the Apostle Paul said, in cleverly devised fables, but rather we have come to faith in the Lord God of creation, who, as we just sang a few minutes ago, not only is he the Lord of creation, but he's the author of our salvation. It's one of the phrases we just sang. It's an amazing thing that the God of creation, who reigns above all, yet concerns himself with our eternal destination. That is why he is the author of our salvation. It came through him. It's accomplished only by him and by his call. And so when you come to the book of Philippians, and I encourage you to turn if you have that or on a phone, however you're going to access that, Philippi was one of those trading stops. It was a medium-sized city. It was something that uh, people knew about. They were familiar with Philippi. Uh, people would stop overnight um, on their way from one place to another in order to, uh, to do business. As a result of that, they, it had a very mixed ethnic clientele, sort of like what we see here in Bloomfield. The ethnic grouping that made up Philippi at this point was probably mostly people from non-Jewish backgrounds, but there was a small synagogue there, a small house of Jewish worship. And typically, as you read through the book of Acts, the synagogue was often the first stop when the Apostle Paul would go into any community. After all, he is not preaching a new religion, but rather he is alerting his own Jewish people that we have good news. The Messiah that we have been waiting for, the one who is called Mashiach in the Hebrew Scriptures, he has arrived. And he is Yeshua Hanotzri, he is Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth. He is the one of whom Moses and the prophets wrote. And so that would have been his initial message when getting to any one of these so-called New Testament cities. But then after they had the opportunity to hear that good word that Messiah had come, he would turn his attention to the Gentiles. And that same pattern is repeated over and over. It's not that he, as, as some uh, with little understanding claim, that he once, at a certain point in his ministry, he turned away from the Jewish people permanently and turned to the Gentiles. No, because the verse that seems to say that in the very next chapter, chapter 14 and 15 of Acts, he immediately goes to another city. Where's the first place he goes to? He seeks out the people of the synagogue, the Jewish people. And he shares with them the good news of the arrival of a Messiah, of a Savior, who is not only for us, he's not only for us as Jewish people, but he's also for everyone who walks the planet. And the inscription in Scripture is very instructive to us. For God so loved the world. And by the way, we, when we hear that today, we kind of glance over. We don't really understand what that meant in that context. The New Testament is primarily Jewish people discovering a Jewish Messiah. But Jesus helps them to lift their eyes beyond their own ethnic group. And he says, as a Jewish rabbi, here's Rabbi Jesus, who is he talking to in that John 3 conversation? He's talking to a Pharisee, Rabbi Nicodemus. In their home synagogues, they would have imagined that God only concerned himself with that one ethnic group. How foolish a position that is. That's why Messiah Jesus says to Messiah Nicodemus, for God so loved the world, not just us, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, that wording was not lost on Nicodemus. Nicodemus heard loud and clear that the doors had been swung open wide and whosoever will might come. No longer was the hope of Israel limited to the people of Israel. Now, the ancient hope of the Jewish people was the hope of all the world, 
that one day the Messiah that God would have born amongst the Jewish people would become the Savior of the world. And if you look into a lot of these songs that we sing, whether they are the older hymns or the praise choruses, these hymns of praise and thanksgiving, all of those are predicated on that idea that God is going to bust out of the the narrow confines of just being concerned about one people, as some people imagined. By the way, that was never true. As far back as Genesis chapter 12, God states that his ultimate goal is to, Genesis 12 verse 3, bless all the peoples of the earth. For God is not willing that any should perish. The worldwide view, the concern for people in Asia, the concern for people in Africa, in the furthest islands of the sea, all of this was evident, even as back specifically as the book of Psalms, where it talks about the good news of salvation going out to the islands of the sea. And it uses a word there, the Hebrew word for salvation is Yeshua, which is the name of Jesus, the only name by which he was known when he walked the earth. That's not an accident that he was called Yeshua, because that's the word that the Old Testament says God's going to send to all the world to bring his salvation. And that's what brings us to Philippians. The people in Philippi needed to hear that good news. Philippi was one of those cities that was, for the most part, under the domination of Hellenism. Hellenism has to do with Greek culture. In the year 332, Alexander the Great conquered the known world. He defeated the great Persian Empire, which was reigning at the time, and he began his march uh, through Europe, through uh, the Middle East, through North Africa, with elephants and war machines that no one had even imagined previously. He conquered the entire known world. He conquered cities. He destroyed cities. But yet when Alexander came to Jerusalem and came to the gates of Jerusalem, he paused because he saw a man in a white robe who had come out from the gates and he was walking toward Alexander by himself with a, just a, a boy as an aide. And he approached Alexander, and through an interpreter, or perhaps through Greek, which was the lingua franca of the day, he told Alexander that God had given all of the kingdoms of the world into Alexander's hands, and that God was going to use Alexander in some sort of way. He wasn't worshiping Alexander, because Alexander is a pagan king who died in a drunken stupor 11 years later. But he recognized that God allowed kingdoms to rise and he allows kingdoms to fall. Alexander thinks to himself, I like this guy, so I'm not going to destroy his city. And that's why we still have evidence of the first temple there in Jerusalem when archaeologists start digging. So all of these things exist in real time, exist in real place, real history. So this city of Philippi, probably a small grouping of towns around the city, was ripe to hear the gospel. They had temples that were dedicated to the Greek gods and goddesses of Zeus and Venus and all of these other characters of imagination that supposed to, supposedly um, were the, the characters of, of these, these Greek melodramas. And Here Paul came preaching about the God who created the earth. And what was so unusual is when they asked to see this God, because the Greeks could point to wonderful statues of their gods and goddesses and say, look at these beautiful statues. They were startled when Paul responded and said, the God of creation cannot be represented by human hands. There is no idol that we can look at, that can hold his glory. So our God is in the heavens. At first they might have mocked this idea, but eventually I think many became, became to understand that truly if there is a God, a creator God in heaven, what mere pair of hands could represent that? And yet some of these third world uh, religions imagine that the spirit of God actually inhabits 
these little idols or icons that they have. So in Philippi, in chapter 2, we come into this unusual situation where Paul is now writing to them a letter. He's writing them after having visited them some years before. So he had been there, but now he's writing a letter, and he talks about initially, at every remembrance of you, I'm happy because I see how far you have come. But what he's going to do in this second chapter is get down to brass tacks. He wants to make sure they understand who they are in Messiah Jesus. He wants them to understand that they are a new creation. When we become believers, we don't turn over a new leaf. We don't reform ourselves. We don't simply resolve to do better. That's human effort. When God looks over the edge of the cloud, a guy who's six foot eight may look very tall to you, but when God looks over the edge of the cloud, all he's seeing are the tops of heads. And some of us have a little less hair than we used to have, but that's all God sees. We all are equal in God's sight. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks upon the heart. So God understood we had a common need. We needed a savior, as one of the hymns reminded us. We need a savior. We didn't need to simply turn over a new leaf, resolve to do better, sign a pledge. We were lost. We were dead in trespasses and sins. But the Lord God of heaven reached down to us and did for us what we could not do for ourselves in bringing us into the family of God. And that's what brings us into Philippians chapter 2. I'm going to read the first few verses and put before you the reality of what this passage is saying. Philippians chapter 2. If therefore there is any encouragement in Messiah, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, then make my joy complete by, and who is he addressing? He's addressing a congregation of believers. He says, make my joy complete, all of you, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, and intent upon one purpose. This was a grouping of people, a congregation that had come oftentimes from very different backgrounds. Some had come out of pagan backgrounds, even though Hellenism had swept the world 300 years previously, there were still pagan tribes in the highlands who worshipped all sorts of gods. There were gods and goddesses coming in from India, which some people had become enamored at. Some people wanted to, excuse the, the phrase, hedge their bets, and they would have in their homes a little idol altar set up to one god, and just to make sure they had the thing covered, set up an idol to a different god and yet a different god. So they had, they thought they had, you know, they had it made. They were, they were bowing down and making offerings to all of these, these different gods. And so was the, the situation there in Philippi. So there were some who had come from backgrounds of Hellenism who worshipped the gods of Greece, who by now were the, also the gods of Rome, because Rome had taken over the world by this point, some of them had come from Jewish homes. They were the first to recognize that Jesus was the Messiah, the first believers, the first of those who came to born-again saving faith in Messiah were the people who were actually waiting for the Messiah. The Greeks weren't waiting for the Messiah. They were seeking wisdom and worldly knowledge. The scripture says the Jewish people were seeking a sign. A sign for what? A sign that the messianic age was about to begin. They had been under the thumb of Rome now for three generations. They had seen their leadership capitulate to Rome, bring in the Romans, and the Romans took over. 
They longed for the malchut, as we say in Hebrew. They longed for the kingdom of God to be reestablished in their midst, like it was back in the days of David and Solomon. But all they saw when they looked around was the iron fist of Rome. You do what you're told, you keep the Roman peace, and all will be well. They longed for the day that they would have their own kingdom back. So in this church, in this congregation of brand new believers in Messiah Jesus, maybe some of them believers as long as 10 years, they still had come from very disparate backgrounds, very different sort of backgrounds. And yet, here's what Paul says to them. Make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. This is a reality that we have seen lived out in this very congregation. When my wife and I first came to this congregation as members, way back around literally 40 years ago, it was probably 83 that we received membership here, it was still yet a congregation of people from wildly different backgrounds. There were some of the old Protestant folks who were inhabitants of this area. This area was settled a lot of times by the Scots and the English and the Presbyterians. And yet in 1852, 1853, this, this congregation was born by people who were searching the scriptures and intent on following the scriptures instead of following human traditions. They recognized the scriptural call that each member have a genuine conversion spirit experience, that each person be genuinely converted and express that publicly through believer's immersion. And it were, were those principles and several others that caused people from different backgrounds to leave some of these established backgrounds, like the one in the church two or three blocks up the street here, and they recognized that they needed a Bible-believing congregation. And so they united. Over the years, many people from different backgrounds joined. People who had been brought up in the Roman Catholic Church recognized their need for personal salvation, that it comes only through an individual response to Jesus as Messiah, that one cannot uh, have a little sprinkle as like a little dab will do you, and that brings you into the kingdom of God. Nowhere in the scripture is that given. Rather, individuals must come to full acceptance, full born-again faith, as the book of Romans chapter 10 tells us. Over the years, additional people joined. There were a number of Jewish people over the years who have been members of this congregation. People started coming in from Africa, from the Caribbean, people whose backgrounds were very different, just like the backgrounds of the people here at Philippi. Normally, people get along best with those who are already like themselves. We have a comfort level with the people who share our culture. If we go to a backyard barbecue, we want to be able to recognize the food. <laughs> We don't want to say, I have to ask, oh, what is that? And then, well, what, how in the world can they eat that? No, we want to have a comfort level. And yet, the church is called to be contra. We're called to swim against the tide. We're called to form a new family. And the family that we form is not often the family of our own choosing. <laughs> you don't get to choose your relatives. Oftentimes when people want to make excuses for odd, weird uncles, they'll say, well, you don't get to choose your relatives. Well, sometimes church can be a little weird. <laughs> there are people from very different backgrounds than we might feel comfortable with. But guess what? Philippians chapter 2, God has intentionally put you in a congregation so that you get ready to see what heaven is like. Because we're told that in heaven, God has called out a people of every tongue, tribe, and nation for his own name's sake. These are the people of the redeemed. These are the individuals who have responded to God's call, who oftentimes, like myself, had to step away from 
the things that we were taught about religion as children, and instead we would search the scriptures because God's truth is found here. This is where God's truth is found, and that's what this church was founded upon, the eternal truths of God's word. So that means when people walk in here, it's not going to look homogeneous. It's not going to look like everyone is from the same grouping. That's the thing that kept me away from the Lord for the first year I was investigating. I would walk into a Protestant church in a certain section of New York City, Dutch Reformed Church. You walk in the back and you say, yeah, this is kind of Dutch. Everyone kind of looks kind of like they just stepped out of Deutsch, the whole Dutch uh, culture. No one there looked like me. <laughs> I didn't see any Yids there. I didn't think, see any Jewish people there. And so I imagined, well, this was just, this is a, a club for people of one grouping. This is like a national club. In my old neighborhood in Brooklyn, there were these Italian clubs that people said, no, that's not really what they are. <laughs> but they would be only for one ethnic group. Our synagogue was essentially the same thing. I attended synagogue as a young person. The synagogue was all of us. We were ethnically Jewish and we were Jewish by religion. The congregation of Messiah Yeshua, of Messiah Jesus, is called to transcend those lines. We're called to recognize brothers and sisters across those ethnic lines. And that, my friends, I can tell you from 40 years of experience, has long been the strength of this congregation. We have recognized that God has done a work in your midst. Now, over the years, the congregation has morphed and changed without a doubt. And there are more people from the nations here. But that's a praise to God because it shows that God is at work in people who used to not walk past the doors of a church like this. Now they call it home. And that's all the work of God. So I see that it's a good thing, and that's what Paul calls us to in these opening verses of Philippians, verses 1 and 2. But then comes the need to get along with one another. And so in verse 3, he says to them, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. Selfishness and empty conceit are the core values that most of the people in the world have. They have self-interest. They have conceit. They imagine that they're all that. But here Paul says, no, do nothing out of selfishness or empty conceit, but rather with humility of mind, let each of you regard the other one as being more important than yourself. Regard the other person as being more important than yourself. And if, by the way, in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, the previous book, in the New Testament canon. Paul makes this point very clear when he talks specifically about the union of Jewish and Gentile believers. The word Gentile is simply a, a handy word that means anyone who's not ethnically Jewish. In Ephesians, apparently there were far more Jewish believers, and it had made perhaps some uncertainties in the early years of that congregation. And Paul reminds them that you're now one body in Messiah. You don't stop being whoever you are. If you're Irish, or if you're Italian, if you're from Granada, Mazel Tov, or you're still from those areas. We don't all lose our identity and become like vanilla when we join a Bible-believing congregation. We retain, whether we're Nigerian, whether we're from Haiti, whether who, wherever we're from, and if you're Jewish, you remain all of those things. And that is the whole point of the body of Messiah because a person walking in is going to say, why in the world are all these people from different backgrounds here? Normally you wouldn't choose to fellowship together. There are negotiations that you have to have when you're going to have a fellowship uh, gathering like we're going to have after the service today. Some people prefer spicy food. Other people prefer mild food. So you label the container spicy and so that People don't get upset and say, oh, they're taking over the church. No, you recognize that it's God put them here. <laughs> Whenever I'm tempted to think how odd someone is in the church, no, wait a second, God put them here. Maybe God put them here for a reason. Maybe the reason is me so that I can become more understanding 
that if God was willing to let me in, <laughs> that's why he, everyone else is here, because God has a sense of humor. So when you think how odd the other people are at church, think about how God might think that you're pretty odd as well. And yet, he loved us, and he set his love on us, not because we were good, but rather because we needed it. So going on in Philippians there, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with the humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Do not look after your own personal interests, but rather the interests of others as well. And that's what congregation is. We recognize that God has put us together as one body. In just a few minutes, we're going to be pausing and remembering the Lord's table. And this Philippians chapter 2 passage is a very good lead up to that very act. Because here we are remembering that the apostles were gathered together and across different preferences, some were tax collectors and others were uh, fishermen, yet God formed one family from them all. And so as believers, you and I look around and recognize these are my brothers and sisters. These are the people through whom I will be, with whom I will be spending eternity. And so this is good practice. And as we look around the congregation, particularly now as we're about to partake in this remembrance of the Lord's table, we recognize that God has sought each one of us out. He has called our name, and we have responded by faith. Let's prepare our hearts and our minds. The deacons will prepare as we anticipate this communion service. Would you bow your head in prayer with me?